All right, you're in the ER. See a two-month-old infant. Baby's got a fever of 103. Breathing in the 40s. Pulse ox is pretty good. Lungs are cleared auscultation. You're doing that. Uh, where's Waldo, right? Where's the source of the fever for this baby? You get an x-ray and you see this. Usually it doesn't come with an arrow, but this one does. Don't be fooled by that thymus. Right upper lobe ah. pneumonia is typically thymus in a young baby. It's homogeneous. It's got a nice edge to it. It's typically right upper lobe or right side of the baby's chest, so don't be fooled making a diagnosis of right upper lobe pneumonia in this baby that has normal thymus tissue. Another baby, four-month-old boy comes in. He's coughing. He's working. He's having difficulty breathing. He's breathing in the 50s. His pulse ox isn't great. He gets an A minus. He's retracting. He's wheezing. What season is it? Winter. You get a mm -hmm. chest x-ray. It's hyperinflated. You're seeing upwards of eight, nine ribs on the AP. You're seeing flattened diaphragms. If I gave you the lateral, you'd see flattened diaphragms on the lateral. You're really looking for hyperinflation to make that diagnosis of bronchiolitis in this young baby. Another one is five-month-old male. Mom says, you know, he's been feeding real poorly. He's not taking in what he usually does. He usually takes four ounces. Now he's taking two. Gets tired. He's had no fever. Tack it to 160, breathing in the 40s. Pulse ox isn't great. Again, he gets an A minus. His lungs are very coarse. You get a chest x-ray on this little bugger. You see a generous x-ray. Now, generous uh, cardiac silhouette, we already said on the AP, we don't want to just look at it because the thymus obscures. They don't take a good inspiratory. But you're looking at these vessels. There's a lot of vessels here. We talked about the middle third or the peripheral third. If that looks like it's got a lot of vessels, the kid's probably a little edematous, a little congestive heart failure going on here. On the lateral view, we really where we want to see cardiomegaly. We're looking for where is that backage of the heart? Is it encroaching on the vertebrae? This one starts to. That's looking like cardiomegaly. And then if you draw a line down, trachea is somewhere right around here. You draw a line down. Instead of bisecting and coming down and bisecting the diaphragm, it's pushed backwards and hitting the vertebrae. That's cardiomegaly until proven otherwise in this little bugger. Another baby, 25-year-old. Mom brings him in for vomiting. He's had no fever. He looks kind of pale. He vomits in front of you. It's bilious. It's green. You're resuscitating this little baby. You shoot a quick x-ray of his belly, and what do you see? We talked about this earlier, the gasless abdomen. Not a lot of air except this large stomach bubble. So you have proximal air, no distal air, gasless abdomen. This is volvulus till proven otherwise. Young baby with bilious vomiting. And lastly, you got this almost two-year-old boy. He's brought in by grandma. She noticed he wasn't moving his right arm. He's been active all day. She's had to pull him from different things. Maybe she doesn't give you the history. Maybe she does. All you know is this baby isn't moving his arm. You send him to x-ray. You make sure you have a good lateral. How do you find that lateral? We're looking for that figure of eight sign. It's hard to see here. Can't see if there's fat pads, but you're certainly looking for fat pads. You look for that anterior humeral line. That looks pretty good. It's bisecting that capitellum right here. But whoa, look at this. Radial capitellar line. It needs to bisect that capitellum, and it's not. That's a radial head dislocation, and that baby needs to have his nursemaid elbow reduced. And that, I believe, is last from my last slide. All right. I will turn it over. All right. Okay, so I apologize uh, for not getting all through all the slides in the last one. They're in the manual. Uh, there's just some mixed bleeds that you guys can go through to look at some different types of bleeds for your um, enjoying uh, pleasure. Um, okay, onwards and outwards. So um, we're going to end up with some mystery uh, radiology. Uh, so first case uh, is a 48-year-old female who presents to the, emer to the emergency department coming to you. She has right side hearing loss. She has right facial tingling, and she has a very unsteady gait that's been progressive over the last several weeks. So you get her up, and again, I'm looking forward to Dr. Henry's lecture tomorrow on the neuro exam, but he always says the most important thing is walking them, right, Mo? If they can't walk, you've got your dispo, right? Anyway, uh, admit, but very important. A lot of times we don't do that, right? We don't get them out of bed and walk them. So you get her up, and she's kind of swaying all over the place. You get a CAT scan. Okay, and it demonstrates. So what level are we seeing here, folks? Which ventricles? So we see the, la so we guys see the lateral ventricles right up here, okay? And then what is this little nose? 
Remember, yeah, so the, well, the third ventricle, right? And then the smiley face, right, that has that mustache, but the smiley face, that quadrigeminal cistern. Anyone see a problem here to explain this patient's uh, symptoms? I, I hear some people thinking over here. I can hear the thought process. Uh, send her, what do you guys think? Normal, Abby normal? Send her home? Tell her walk it off? Okay, so let's look at some other cuts. As we go further down, we're looking at the level of the cerebellum and the level of the supracellar cistern. And again, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you with all those cisterns, but the idea being that we'll look at some cases where the cisterns are not normal later on. But um, let's look at the fourth ventricle. Does anyone see the fourth ventricle on this image? I don't know. I have to get my glasses out, but they're not going to see all the way over there. But do you guys maybe, maybe, what do you guys think? He, maybe there? I can hallucinate that, I think. But, okay, so this is what, this is, this is your image, okay? So radiology says, I, I don't look, I don't see any bleed. No acute mass. Okay, so we go further down. I don't know, I mean, looks kind of hard to see the fourth ventricle, right? As we talked about the cerebellum. So what are you gonna do next? So radiology comes over and says, looks pretty good to me, you know? So what are you gonna do next? Discharge the patient, refer her to a primary care physician. Uh, for routine follow-up in two weeks, right? Um, and if, MRI, I like that idea. Now, how many of you all can get MRI relatively quickly? Uh, hands up, I like to see. Um, you can, that's, I think that's awesome. I think it's still, you know, at Stanford we have an MRI, but it's like, you know, in another part of the building, patients disappear for a long period of time, and there's always a queue, right, to get them in there. Um, so, um, but I think this is a patient who you'd be very concerned about, and aren't you glad you got it? All right, so what does she have? So there's a mass in the cerebellar area that's involving the pons, okay? Do you guys remember that weird tumor, right, from, like, school, from way, way, way back there? The cerebellar pontine angle tumor, right? So you can see again here, it's another image showing that the MRI is really gonna show that area of the cerebellum much better than a CAT scan. And this is the, the famous acoustic neuroma, also known as the vestibular schwannoma, if you wanna sound very smart. Um, the tumor arises within the Schwann cells of the, of the eighth cranial nerve. And you can see here how the CAT scan is relatively poor at seeing that region of the posterior fossa and how MRI really pops it right out, okay? So, makes a big difference there. Um, next patient, 72-year-old female, comes in the emergency department, um, denies a history of trauma, but she's having worsening of her headache. And again, you get her up, you ask her to remember three things, and she can remember like nothing at five minutes. So very poor memory, and she also has an ataxic gait. Um, so you get a head CT. What do you guys think here? So I would say, first of all, let's just say that there's no blood here, okay? But what do you guys think of the, of the size of the ventricles? They're huge, right? Okay, so they're really big. Remember we talked about obstructing versus non-obstructing hydrocephalus? What did we say was the key? Where are most blocks? That little strip, right? The aqueduct of Sylvius between the third and the fourth. So if you look here, notice that her fourth ventricle is still very open right here. Do you guys see that? So grandma has a communicating hydrocephalus, right? Uh, now, they still may want to shunt her, but the major thing, that they're more concerned about a, like a non-communicating, right, where there's an obstructive hydrocephalus uh, for putting a shunt in. Okay, so, um, it, whoop, wrong, wrong way here? Let me see what I'm doing. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, this one, this is, a, this is a great case. 25-year-old male comes to you. You're working over at UNLV Emergency Department. Um, he was at a rave. Um, he may or may not have used some drugs. Um, he comes into you. Um, he's got a decreased mental status with a Glasgow of 11, and his pupils are dilated bilaterally, and he's not really responding to you at all. You do a CAT scan. Ready, set, go. Okay. I'll walk you through. Okay, you see the ventricles there? I don't see a lot of blood. You guys see any? Not really, right? Okay, so ventricles are there, right? Now, what do we say about those cisterns? Remember those cisterns? Yeah, what happened to them? Someone steal them? They're gone, 
Someone said they're gone. Okay, so what's going on here? What is that a sign of? Swelling, right? So the patient was at a rave, right? So what do you think they took? Little X, right? And what do you do when you take X? They all have those like monkey packs on the back, right? Drinking a lot of water. Um, so this patient actually had diffuse cerebral edema, okay? And what you're seeing there is see how tight everything is? And so this is another reason why it's very important to read the CAT scan, not just for blood, right? But also to look and make sure that the ventricles are open, right? Normal size, but very importantly to make sure that those basal or cisterns are open. All right, to tell you the truth, this was read first by radiology as normal. All right, of course, on overread by the attending, it was read as abnormal, right? But just, I think we would all, after our 30 minute training course, right? Um, and the Corvette is waiting for you, um, say that this doesn't look so good. And with that, I'm going to end it up for Robert. Okay. So we're going to start with a nice, uplifting case to end the day. So. This was an unfortunate woman. She was a domestic assault. I saw her at the very end of a night shift, a busy night shift. And this woman was um, beaten pretty severely about the head and neck by her significant other. And she came in with a GCS of four, almost abtunded, and so was intubated pretty promptly per ATLS protocol. And at that point, I had signed out. I had gone to do my charts. And as I'm finishing up, the paramedic who had brought her in came up and said, hey, doc, I heard she's going to the OR. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm not surprised figuring, you know, she had a subdural or something like that. And the paramedic said, how'd she get a diaphragmatic rupture from that? That doesn't make sense. And I said, I agree, that doesn't make sense. So I got up and I went back in the trauma bay and this was her x-ray. And they're actively packing her up. They called the OR, they were getting her ready um, for an X-lap and possible thoracotomy because she had this total whiteout on her left and it may not project super well, but her NG tube is curling up here into her chest. So she was being booked for an x lap for presumptive diaphragmatic rupture. And I said, let's wait one second. She's stable. Do me a favor, don't take her to the OR. Pull her two back and give her a few minutes and let's reevaluate. And sure enough, when you do your ABCs, if you start with the airway, her ET tube is sitting down here in her right lung. She's a right main stem intubation, and she had complete atelectasis on her left. So this lady could have ended up with some pretty significant surgery that she didn't need, and it would have delayed the craniotomy that she ultimately ended up needing for her large subdural. So try not to get happy eyes. This is the perfect case for being systematic, doing the ABCs, no matter what the lungs look like, get to them last, all right? You have time, be systematic. And if you had started with the airway, you would have seen that ET tube sitting in the right main. The clue, one of the clues to this is where is her heart? It's not there, right? You can't see it. And so, oh yeah, this was her 20 minutes later with her tube pulled back. She's starting to aerate that lung. Now her NG tube's below the diaphragm. And so the key with this is that atelectasis is volume loss. It's retractive, it pulls everything to the side. So it's pulling the heart and everything over so we can't see it. This was a pediatric patient with a huge mucus plug and it basically had atelectasis on the left. And same thing, it's pulling the heart away. A huge pleural effusion, which is what it was presumed this lady had, would deflect away, it's space occupying, it would push stuff away <coughs> from the affected side. So just keep that in mind, be systematic. This guy came in, he was activated as a, as a trauma activation, pretty big guy, he was probably about 240, 6'4", big, big guy, flew over the handlebars of his bike and landed on his right side and came in complaining of severe right chest pain. He was tachycardic, but otherwise, was, if anything, he was hypertensive, he was not hypoxic, and here's his x-ray. So who's putting in a chest tube? Good, we almost did, because it was a knee-jerk reaction. We saw this, we were expecting him to have a hemothorax, look like he'd have rib fractures in a hemothorax, and thank God he was stable, because it gave us a few minutes to actually think about what we were looking at. How do we know this is not a hemothorax? It's, how the, it's the technique that the film was shot in, 
all right? This is, if you look at it, this is a supine trauma film. We said that when you lay somebody flat, a hemothorax layers this way, and so it would make the lung look hazy. It doesn't layer like this, unless it's loculated for some reason, and a healthy 24-year-old guy shouldn't have a loculated hemothorax, right? So this is his CAT scan. He was stable, we were able to get him to scan. And what we saw is, he has all this up in his chest. This is, this is bowel contents and mesenteric fat. So then the question was, does this guy have a diaphragmatic injury? Well, they're incredibly rare from blunt trauma on the right because the liver's in the way. And he had no other traumatic findings on the skin. He had no blood, no rib fractures, no free fluid. The other thing is, he has normal lung up here. If all of a sudden we suddenly filled half his chest with bowel contents, it would have compressed that right lung down. It would have been atelectatic and squished. This is congenital. This is one of the rare ones that didn't present early on. And he had a congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and we just happened to find it on trauma. So I printed this off for him, told him to keep it in his wallet, and if he ever did get in a trauma, show it to him before they put a chest tube in him. <laughs> so remember to evaluate technique. It can really, really have a big impact on how you interpret the x-ray. Okay. Motorcycle crash. This guy comes in, he's in rough shape. He's hypotensive, tachycardic, hypoxic. Who's putting in a chest tube now? Every hand should be up right now, all right? This is kind of a quintessential deep sulcus sign. You see this plunging diaphragm over here, this kind of lucency behind it. If you look closely, he also has multiple rib fractures. And if you really look closely, this lung is darker than this lung. So he probably has a hemothorax as well. And the thing that really scares me is he's starting to shift over which is probably why he's hypotensive, all right? So this is a traumatic tension hemopneumothorax. It needs emergent chest tube. This kid, ah, come here. This kid came in, flew over the handlebars, landed, he didn't land on outstretched hand, he kind of landed funny, which is why this is angled more volarly. Um, so what do you guys think? Just a distal radius fracture, right? No. This is why you have to memorize those silly eponyms and look carefully at the DRUJ. So on the lateral, here's the ulnar styloid. It should be pointing up here towards the triquetrum, and instead it's pointing up here into space. All right? So this is a Galeazzi fracture dislocation. This is why we memorize them, because they can be subtle. And I can tell you radiology missed this. We saw it, this kid at a community hospital. Um, and we recognized and ended up transferring it to the pediatric hospital for more definitive care, but radiology totally missed this. So remember, be systematic, ABCs, look for that DRUJ. Okay. This lady tripped going down a couple of stairs, came in with pretty severe foot pain. Films initially read as normal, and she fractured through there, fractured through here, fractured here. This is a Lisfranc fracture dislocation. And in retrospect, when you go back and look, her alignment is off. But you really gotta be diligent and pay careful attention and look at it, all right? Be very cautious of this. If somebody has significant pain and tenderness over the midfoot, difficulty ambulating, think about a Lisfranc fracture dislocation. Okay. This guy comes in. It's Vegas, it's happy hour. He falls and he's complaining of knee pain. So when you look at it, on the AP, he's got some asymmetric joint space narrowing. But we know that overweight people tend to have accelerated osteoarthritis and that they may have with that some asymmetric joint space narrowing. But the problem is that's usually medial joint space narrowing, not lateral. This is a knee dislocation. This is how subtle it can be. This guy actually ended up uh, going emergently to the OR because he sat in our ER for about two hours, had pulses, and then lost them. And because he was so unstable, he was in near anatomic alignment, and he was big, so his physical exam was somewhat challenging, his knee dislocation got missed. So you really have to be diligent about a good knee exam and realize that you can have a pretty severe injury with pretty normal looking radiographs. And that, okay. One more, this is a pedestrian struck. 
struck pretty much by the bumper right at the knee level, had some pretty significant uh, pain and difficulty ambulating. His AP radiograph looks pretty good. When you look at the lateral, at first glance it doesn't look too bad, maybe an effusion up there. If you flip this though, there's a nice straight line coming across. If you flip this laterally, this is a lipohemarthrosis. This person has, by definition, an intraarticular fracture. And when we scanned them, sure enough, you see this is all depressed tibial plateau here. There's a chunk off the back. And this is pretty classic for what's known as a fender or a bumper fracture. Because classically, pedestrians get hit on the lateral side. This person blew out their medial collateral ligament and allowed this femoral condyle to smash down in to the lateral tibial plateau. You never see this on a radiograph. You know, thank God they have that lipohemarthrosis. You let this person walk around on that, it's going to depress. As it was, she was able to be treated non-operatively, thankfully. So remember, flip your x-rays laterally so you can look for those lipohemarthrosis.